self-development with tactics. So today we're gonna read some letters to Lucilius. Maybe it's gonna be one. Maybe it's gonna be two. Maybe it's gonna be a bunch of them. But um, we're gonna decide in kind of a random manner which one we're gonna go first with, and then we um, just see, you know, in terms of length, in terms of the title. But let's just pick this one on the fickleness of fortune, which is letter ninety-eight. Which is already quite comprehensive, and you know, it, it has some length. And yeah, let's see. On the fickleness of fortune, the first, I think, paragraph. I actually do not know what the numbers are standing for, but first. You need never believe that anyone who depends upon happiness is happy. It is a fragile support, this delight in adventitious things. The joy which entered from without will some day depart. But that joy which springs wholly from oneself is leal and sound. It increases and attends us to the last, while all other things which provoke the admiration of the crowd are but temporary goods. You may reply, what do you mean? Cannot such things serve both for utility and for delight? Of course, but only if they depend on us and not we on them. The second. All things that fortune looks upon become productive and pleasant, only if he who possesses them is in possession also of himself, and is not in the power of what or that which belongs to him. For men make a mistake, my dear Lucilius, if they hold that anything good or evil either is bestowed upon us by fortune. It is simply the raw material of goods and ills that she gives us or she gives to us, the sources of things which, in our keeping, will develop into good or evil. For the soul is more powerful than any sort of fortune, but its own agency, it guides its affairs in either direction, and of its own power it can produce a happy life or a wretched one. The third. A bad man makes everything bad, even things which had come with the appearance of what is best, but the upright and honest man corrects the wrongs of fortune and softens hardship and bitterness because he knows how to endure them. He likewise accepts prosperity with appreciation and moderation and stands up against trouble with steadiness and courage. Though a man be prudent, though he conduct all his interests with well-balanced judgment, though he attempt nothing beyond his strength, he will not attain the good which is unallowed or unalloyed and beyond the reach of threats, unless he is sure in dealing with that which is unsure. The fourth. For whether you prefer to observe other men, and it is easy to make up one's mind when judging the affairs of others, or whether you observe yourself with all prejustice laid aside, you will perceive and acknowledge that there is no utility in all these desirable and beloved things unless you equip yourself in opposition to the fickleness and chance and its consequences, and unless you repeat to yourself often and uncomplainingly at every mishap the words heaven decreed it otherwise. Which really, really, really reminds me of Amor Fati, love, faith. No matter what is happening, love it. Don't merely like it, but love it. The fifth, nay rather to adopt the phrase which is braver and nearer the truth, one on which you may more safely prop your spirit, say to yourself, whenever things turn out contrary to your expectation, heaven decreed better. If you are thus poised, nothing will affect you, and a man will be thus poised if he reflects on the possible ups and downs in human affairs before he feels their force, and if he comes to regard children or wife or pro property with the idea that he will not necessarily possess them always, and that he will not be any more wretched just because he ceases to possess them. Which is about negative visualization. Imagining and visualizing that on some day, maybe in the future, things are not going to be that good. 
things are actually going to be quite bad and that you're not going to quote unquote possess children or your wife anymore. Maybe due to some other man, maybe due to um, death, maybe due to whatever. But by visualizing that, by making yourself ready for that, for the day to come, basically, when this day comes, it's not going to be that bad. It's not going to be. It's not going to be that of a huge deal. Quite. The sixth one. It is tragic for the soul to be apprehensive of the future and wretched. I think it is wretched in anticipation of wretchedness, consumed with an anxious desire that the objects which give pleasure may remain in its possession to the very end. For such a soul will never be at rest. In waiting for the future, it will lose the present blessings which it might enjoy. And there is no difference between grief for something lost and the fear of losing it. Which is also one of the reasons why uh, material possessions are, you know, quite dangerous. Fuck off. Because nobody knows if you're going to have them or if you're going to possess them forever. You know, if, if they're not going to be stolen you're gonna lose them if you kind of get rid of them in some kind of other way the seventh one but i do not for this reason advise you to be indifferent rather do you turn aside from your whatever may cause fear be sure to foresee whatever can be foreseen by planning observe and avoid long before it happens anything that is likely to do you harm to effect this your best assistance will be a spirit of confidence and a mind strong and resolved to endure all things he who can bear fortune can also beware of fortune at any rate there is no dashing of billows when the seas come and there is nothing more wretched or foolish than premature fear what manners it is to anticipate one's troubles and there is nothing more wretched or foolish, foolish, than premature fear. And premature fear is basically being anxious, isn't it? You know, fearing that there is going to be something, or maybe there is not going to be something. Which is, we are suffering more in imagination than we do in reality. By Seneca, the young. Which is an amazing quote and a really eye-opening one, at my point of view, because... Think about it. We often fear things just because we're having them in our mind. We fear the future not being as we anticipate it. We fear some other things that have not happened yet. Which does not make any sense because, well, even though planning ahead, as, as you also said there, makes sense. Why exactly do we anticipate something bad to happen? The eighth one. In fine to express my thoughts in brief com compass and portray to you those busybodies and self tormentors They are as uncontrolled in the midst of their troubles as they are before them. He suffers more than is necessary who suffers before it is necessary. This is also an amazing one. He who suffers more than is necessary, who suffers before it is necessary. Such men do not weigh the amount of their suffering by reason of the same failing, which prevents them from being ready for it. And with the same lack of restraint, they fondly imagine that their luck will last forever and fondly imagine that their gains are bound to increase as well as merely continue. They forget this springboard on which mortal things are tossed and they guarantee for themselves exclusively a steady continuance of the gifts of chance. The ninth one. For this very reason, I regard as excellence the saying of Metrodorus in a letter of consolation to his sister on the loss of her son, a lad of great promise. All the good of mortal is mortal. He is referring to those goods towards which man rush in skulls or shoals, shoals, whatever. For the real go good does not perish, it is certain and lasting, and it consists of wisdom and virtue. It is the only immortal thing that falls to mortal lot. Ten, or the tenth point. But men are so wayward and so forgetful of their goal and of the points to watch which every day jostles them, and they are surprised at losing anything, although some day they are bound to lose everything. Anything of which you are entitled 
The owner is in your possession, but is not your own. For there is no strength in that which is weak, nor anything lasting and invincible in which is frail. We must lose our lives as surely as we lose our property, and this, if we understand the truth, is itself a consolation. Loss or lose it with equanimity, for you must lose your life also. The eleventh one. What reasons or what resource do we find then in the face of these losses? Simply this, to keep in memory the things we have lost and not to suffer the enjoyment which we have derived from them to pass away along with them. To have may, to have may be taken from us, to have had never. A man is thankless in the highest degree if after losing something he feels no obligation for having received it. Chance robs us of the things but leaves us its use and its enjoyment. And we have lost this if we are so unfair as to regret. The twelfth, just say to yourself, of all these experiences that seem so frightful, none is insuperable. Insuperable, I think. Separate trials have been overcome by many. Fire by Musius, crucifixion by Regulus, poison by Socrates, exile by Rutilius, and a sword inflicted death by Cato. Therefore, let us also overcome something. Which I've read before, and it is still amazing if you think about it. The 13th. Again, those objects which attract the crowd and the appearance of beauty and happiness have been scorned by many men and on many occasions. Fabricius, when he was general, refused riches, and when he was censor, branded them with disapproval. Tubero deemed poverty worthy both of himself and of the deity on the capital when by the use of gods could still use. Oh no, by the use of earthware, dishes at a public festival, he showed that man should be satisfied with that which the gods could still us. Or could still use, I'm sorry. The elder Sixtius rejected the honors of office. He was born with an obligation to take part in public affairs and yet would not accept the broad stripe even when they defy what the defied, Julius offered it to him, for he understood that what can be given can also be taken away. Let us also therefore carry out some courageous act of our own accord. Let us be included among the ideal types of history. Well, I don't actually know whether it is smart to uh, to reject something just because you, if I've understood it correctly. Just because you know and think that you're going to lose it someday. But anyway, the 14th. Um, why have we been slack? Why do we lose heart? That which could be done can be done if only we purify our souls and follow nature. If for when one strays away from nature, one is compelled to crave and fear and be slave to the things of chance. We may return to the path or true path we may be restored to our proper state. Let us therefore be so, in order that we may be able to endure pain in whatever from it attacks our bodies, and say to fortune, you may have to deal with a man, seek someone whom you can conquer. I do want to repeat that. We may return to the true path, we may be restored to our proper state, let us therefore be so, in order that we may be able to endure pain in whatever form it attacks our bodies. And say to fortune, you may have to deal with a man, seek someone whom you can conquer. The 15th. By these words and words of, uh, of, a, like kind, what? of a like kind, the malignity of the ulka is quieted down. And I hope indeed that it can be reduced and either cured or brought to a stop and grow old along with the patient himself. I am, however, comfortable in my mind regarding him. What we are now discussing is our own loss, the taking of, an, uh, of a most excellent old man. For he himself has lived a full life and anything additional may be craved by him, not for his own sake, but for the sake of those who need his service. S. Yes. Sixteenth. In continuing to live, he deals generously. Some other person might have put an end to those sufferings. But our friend considers it no less space to flee from death than to flee towards death. But comes the answer, 
if circumstances warrant, shall he not take his departure? Of course, if he can no longer be of service to anyone, if all his businesses will be deal if all his business will be to deal with pain. Which I think is about suicide, isn't it? And as far as I remember, Stoics have uh, not demonized suicide, but rather thought about it and have chosen it as a proper way to 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 leave the world. And I mean, if you think about it, like if all your businesses can't serve anyone, and you know that you can't do much more than than what you have done, and you know there's there's an end to what you have done, and there's there's nothing more, like. One can consider it. The problem is, who decides that? You know, you probably have to decide for yourself. Like, okay, my businesses are not worth any more uh, being continued or continued. But the problem is, like, do we really think in a straight way? Most often we don't. Um... In continu- continuing to live, he deals generously. Some other person might have put an... Oh, I've read this. This, my dear Lucilius, is what we mean by studying philosophy while applying it, by practicing it on truth. Note what courage a prudent man possesses against death or against pain when the one approaches and the other weighs heavily. What ought to be done must be learned from one who does it. Which is a very, very, very good point, by the way. You know, why should I be learning something from somebody that is not doing his or her work? 18th, up to now we have dealt with arguments, whether any man can resist pain or whether the approach of death can cast down even great souls. Why discuss it further? Here is an immediate fact for us to tackle. Death does not make our friend brave to face pain, nor pain to face death. Rather, does he trust himself in the face of both? He does not suffer with resignation because he hopes for death, nor does he die gladly because he is tired of suffering. Pain he endures, death he awaits. Farewell. Which, I mean, it is crazy if you await death and therefore are able to endure the pain. Well, which is like, I'm not that I'm gonna die. Uh, memento mori. Remember death. And therefore, being able to, to deal with heavy amounts of pain. With that being said, I'm going to end the episode. I'm going to leave it like this, in this open spirit, open-ended episode. Anyway, see you. Bye-bye. Stay safe.